Welcome to another episode of This Week with Sabir. In today's hot seat is uh, Seth Erickson. Let me tell you, tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Seth Erickson's personality and particular brand of humor is the kind that draws people to him. He is a quick thinker with the ability to distill complex ideas into easy to understand information, and he's not afraid to work hard and apply tenacity uh, when needed. Seth uses storytelling as a way of helping businesses, specifically startups. Stats say 90% of startups fail. Seth's vision is to reduce the disheartening number by at least 10%. He has seen firsthand how incorporating storytelling can make a presentation and product stand out and become more memorable to you, to investors and customers alike. And um, Seth, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. And more importantly, one thing I got to say, this book is a phenomenal book. One of the funniest books I've read. So <laughs> uh, I personally got the the Kindle version. Seth, you were telling me uh, this week uh, it uh, it went into paperback and hard hardcover, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you prefer print, then that um, that's available. And sometime, hopefully early next year, we'll have the audio book done. <laughs> oh, perfect. I, I, I'm an, I love audio books uh, because I can listen and re-listen to them so many times mm -hmm. uh and and it's on amazon correct yes yeah very cool by the way we, we you know um uh seth was kind enough to actually give us a, uh, a special uh that i'm going to actually flash on the screen a little bit later in the interview uh so stay tuned uh for that so let's start with why do so many startups have trouble telling their story and I've, by the way seth I've had many, many startup founders on this show, <laughs> and and everybody has gone through so many pivots and so many journeys uh, uh, through that to get their story right. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think from what I've seen, um, the root of the problem really exists in the fact that when you know people go to school, right? They want to learn. They want to get really good at that thing that they do, and you know, whether it's technology or business or whatever, right? Like they're focused on that. And that's, that's understandable, right? Like people who are good at something get tend to get paid better than people who are not. Um, but what I what I have not seen is very many founders who have learned anything about um, design, marketing, branding, storytelling, you know, maybe they had to take, you know, some mandatory classes on writing, uh, but they didn't go past the one on one class. And so um, quite often, um, they never were exposed to, you know, concepts like branding or storytelling in an extensive way where they would go, oh, I need to be applying this, right? What they were doing was they're working in their labs and their garages, you know, toiling away to, to create, um, this amazing product or service or, uh, new idea. And so it's just really a focus thing, right? And, and like I said, it's understandable why people get there. So it's not like, you know, when we work with founders, we're like, why don't you get this? Oh, it's like this education process that has to happen about how you think about it because building it is one thing, but then when you take it to the world or you take it to investors, that's a whole different conversation. And and so that's that's where I kind of see people, um, they they kind of fall down in that area because they just didn't have that experience and that that kind of training on how do you communicate and what is all how does all this stuff work? So. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in some cases, the, the thing is, it, and actually in most of the cases, especially if you think about tech startups, the founders tend to be engineers. They tend to be scientists. They tend to be mathematicians. Mm -hmm. They tend to be everything that's not marketing or right. that's not right. sales, you know? Right. Right. And and if your skill set, I mean, that's where, you know, that marriage of the tech with a, with a marketing person. So if you know how to build this thing, Okay, do, do you have a partner that can actually tell a great story around that thing that you're creating? Why that's an incredible value? Why is it, what, what, what kind of story that does it have? For example, if you, if you get your co coffee beans in, or in a sustainable way, you think it's just a technical thing, but a, a good marketing person can take that and turn it into a very nice story, including photos, videos, content, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's Wozniak it, or uh, not Wozniak, Wozniak and, uh, and Jobs, right? Yeah. Like you have had the one person who had technical knowledge, not that Jobs didn't, but Jobs had more of that, um, that kind of marketing uh, type aspect to, to his personality. And so, you know, uh, Wozniak would create something amazing and then Jobs would be like, 
well, we got to sell this thing and how are we going to do that? And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to make it like the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> you know. And so that partnership obviously uh, created a lot of fruit, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to founders who are like, you know, this thing would be really successful if only for those pesky humans that I have to deal with. <laughs> you know, like, they're always messing things up, you know, and it's like, well, that's why you need to understand how you're communicating with people and, and, and how people respond to how you communicate. And so, um, you know, in that, like, I'm sure you've seen this, right? Like the, the, the pitch deck, that's like a hundred slides. Right. And it's just the person standing up there droning on and on and on and on and on and on. And it's just like that, that doesn't work because that's not how the human brain works. It's not how we want to receive information. And so a lot of that just ends up bouncing off of us and, you know, you can walk out of a pitch and be like, I have no idea what that guy was, was trying to do, you know? And so, um, so yeah, it's all very, very important. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Imagine Seth, if you, you know, as you were saying that what came to my mind and I have been part of right. a lot of those kind of pitch <laughs> meetings and stuff like that. I actually, for my business, I, I don't do any pitches. What I do is I do an exploratory call to understand well, what's your need. Like, what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And then based on that, it's a conversation. And if you want, me to put it into a presentation, I'll do that because some people like to consume it in a different way. So I'll, I'll, I'll do it if you, if you're asking me to, otherwise let's have a conversation. What is the pain point of your business? Right. Mm -hmm. I want to understand that. It's like when, when you were saying it and knowing that you're a very humorous person, what, the, the, the image that was going through my mind is you, you enter stop and shop, you know, like a supermarket. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as you enter, I hold you by hand. And I take you aisle by aisle and show you every <laughs> single product yeah. to tell you whether you care about it or not. Like even in the pet section, I, I'm taking you through all the bird seeds to to avian thing and fish thing, and you may not even have you may not even have any kind of pets at all. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. I mean, there there's actually like when 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 I end up talking to founders, like about pitch decks in particular, I'm like, yeah, you need to get this thing down to like 15 to 20 slides max. And you don't need to have a lot of text. And they look at me like I'm, you know, slapping their baby across <laughs> the face. They're like, I don't understand. And so I have to kind of take them through and go, look, nobody cares about the numbers until they're interested in your idea or your concept, right? Like, then I want to know the numbers. Then I want to understand um, how this thing's going to make money. Right. But if I don't care about your idea in the first place, then getting to the making money discussion is not even on the table. And so I often say it's, you know, it's an order of operations problem. I mean, the other thing that they do is, or they'll start with the pitch deck talking about them and how amazing they are and how qualified they are. And I'm like, no, you need to move that to the end and then say, here's, here's my idea. Get the, get people interested. Then, you know, you can talk the numbers with the investors, then you can explain why you're qualified for it. Right. But that whole thing is kind of inverted on, on how the conversation sh should flow. Because, um, like you said, you care about, about whatever the problem is. Right. And so tell me about the problem, not about, you know, you and not about, you know, all this supposed money we're going to make, you know, <laughs> cause it's like, well, I've heard that you know, a thousand times, we're going to make so much money, you know, uh, was it Kiyosaki talked about like the example of like, um, if we could just get 1% of the dog food market, we'd make millions of dollars, you know, and it's like, yeah, but what's, what's the problem? What's the idea? How are we going to, you know, tell me that, explain to me why I should even care in the first place. And then I might be interested. So, um, I mean, Seth, those are all of all of the pitches that don't that don't get funded on Shark <laughs> Tank any episode, any yeah. season. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's why like but but people see that and and they'll go, oh, it just wasn't a good idea. That's why they didn't get funded. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There's a process here. You're just not seeing the process. So let me let me help educate you. Um, I can I can like let's say you're an archer. I can help you get closer to the target. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to help you hit the bullseye, but if I tell you don't shoot the arrow into the ground, then you're going to be closer to the bullseye. If I say, you know, you need to hold straight, you're going to get closer to the bullseye. So, you know, there's a lot of coaching that goes along in these discussions where it's like, do this, don't do that. Here's the process you want to follow. This, this makes sense. 
you know, and, and people will respond better to you. It doesn't mean that they're going to accept your idea, but you're going to be off on, on a much better foot. So we kind of went off and onto a tangent about, uh, pitch decks, but I just worked with somebody on this yesterday. So it's kind of on my mind and I know it's relevant to your audience. No, but, but, uh, Seth, it's, it's really important because, uh, presentation tends to be one of those tools and that every entrepreneur thinks that, uh, it's necessary, which it can be, but it, it doesn't have to be hundred pages long. It could be eight pages, yeah. hard hitting eight pages, very factual that tells you what are you trying to solve? Who are you trying to address? And why do you think your solution, what is your solution? Why do you think your solution is the right solution? And then after that, slide seven and eight can say, this is our team. You mm -hmm. know, we have one person who have come up with seven startups and exited seven, five of them. Great. T that's tail end, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on and so forth. Like it doesn't have to be like first show them, you know, I, I actually helped um, someone through this. I said the analogy I would use is uh, w when you're watching TV, when it goes into commercial, they don't show you the whole movie. They show you a trailer that's coming to a theater near you. Mm -hmm. What is your trailer like? What is yeah. that 30 second version of it? What is the 60 second version? People call it elevator pitch, right? Mm -hmm. What is that thing? If I ask you, what do you do, right? Can you can you sp uh, spill it to me and, and tell me, okay, you know what? 30 seconds, this is what it is. Okay, I got it, right? Mm -hmm. Or I don't got it, you know, because I have no idea. You're trying to explain calculus to me. You know, I don't right. get it, you know. Yeah. Even though I'm very good at math, by the way. <laughs> Not everybody else is, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, just another quick tip, like, uh, you know, I'll see it, it's just lots of text. And it's like, well, do you want them to be reading the text or listening to you? Because we can't do both. Right. Like, so either you want them listening to you and what you're saying, or you want them reading, in which case, what's the point of you even standing up there talking? You can let them flip through the, <laughs> flip through the deck. You know? <laughs> Seth, Seth, even, even uh, uh, Ten Commandments came down on a tablet, yeah. and it was bullet points. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> simplified. Yeah, so yeah, that was one of the things that when I was talking to the, uh, this, this, this group yesterday was like, yeah, you got way too much text. Well, what do you mean? And I'm like, too much text? Like, are you are you reading the text that's on there? Because that's redundant anyway. So like, you know, anyway. Um, so that's just another tip that I that I give people to think about. It's like, you can put numbers on there, maybe have three or four. This one, this one, this one. This is what's important, right? Help people focus on on what you want them to focus. Don't distract them with all this other noise and, and whatnot. So anyway. And, we're, we're, we're kind of on a rabbit hole, I think. <laughs> so Seth, uh, from your perspective, what is the anatomy of a like a successful storytelling? What, what does that look like if you if you were to look at it from a very high level? Um, well, so the the most popular uh, so stories are a pattern and um, and there's a there's really like several different ones that you can use. The hero's journey is obviously um, widely known, um, but that's a 15 step journey. And so, um, so you can cut that down into, you know, like you can make a really short story by saying, who's the hero, who's the villain and what does the hero want? And then you kind of have a beginning, middle and end. Um, and so, um, we tend to, to think in, in threes. So you can, you can really shorten that down. Uh, like in the book I talked about, uh, who I can't remember who had the quote I came, I saw, I conquered, right? That was, that was beginning, middle, and end. And it's, it's literally a story in, in, you know, one very short sentence or three sh short sentences. Um, I guess it depends on if you got commas in there or not, but, uh, so, <laughs> so, um, problem and solution is, is the quickest story you can tell. Uh, it's basically what infomercials use all the time. You know, like when they're like, don't you hate it when you have to clean your windows? They literally start with the problem and then they go right into, well, my handy whatchamajigger thing will make it so you don't have to ever clean windows again, right? Like that is a, a simplified short story that's beginning and end. Um, but like I said, the hero's journey, uh, yeah, you need to have your hero. You need to understand who the villain is, basically what the problem they're facing is. What is the hero trying to achieve that they can achieve? You need to be able to set up, um, set up you know, some sort of emotion into the story because we as humans don't respond to anything that is not emotionally based. 
typically. Um, you need to be able to kind of paint a picture in a, per in a person's head of like, here's what my life would be like if I use this product. Here's what my life might look like if I don't have this product in my life, you know? And so, um, so those are some of the fundamental elements that I believe a good story should have. Um, obviously you can go in greater depth, which the hero's journey does because there's more steps to that, but like anywhere from five, five to seven of those different pieces, um, will give you enough ingredients to start building a story that people will be willing to sit down and listen, listen to. I so. said uh, one of the recommendations you had in, in the book and in, in the very beginning, uh, you mentioned a TED talk by, uh, I, I don't want to get the person's name wrong. Uh, Yuri uh, Hassan. Uh, yeah. TED talk uh, about active listening and I mean, being a listener and a speaker, right. And I actually watched it. It's a, it's a quick, by the way, you could look for his name. Um, and um, you can look up the uh, the TED talk. It's like 15 minutes long. It's less than 15 minutes, 14 and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting. Like what you were just saying, that uh, when a speaker speaks, well, a listener is trying to sync up the frequency, basically, mm -hmm. right? To, yeah. to try to understand. Like if your frequency is so high as a speaker that the person is not getting it, then you're missing the boat, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's listening to you at all, right? Yeah. But when when that sync up happens, then they start visualizing what you're saying. Now they're at the second stage of, of that conversation. Like, mm. you know, for example, with the storytelling with uh, for uh, for startups, if the founder takes your, you know, you said, um, I, I came, I saw, I conquered, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What it does to me as a listener is says, what did, what did he conquer? How did he <laughs> conquer it? What happened? I wanna know more, tell me more, right? It just makes me, my mind is set now to listen to the next sentence coming out mm -hmm. of your mouth, right? Yeah. But if you start talking about, oh yeah, the, the boats, we, we docked it in on, on the thing and you start telling, I'm lost already. Like I, I'm, not, I'm not interested, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna yeah. move on from the story. I don't care about it you know, anymore. Like I, I think that's the, that's the kind of the essence of, of um, that storytelling, like you're saying, like uh, there is a there is a uh, there's an anatomy to it. There's a uh, structure to it. How you tell it, and you want to grab that because investors are people too, right? Mm -hmm. If if you say that, oh, you know what, ninety five percent of this problem has not been solved, then naturally, as an investor, I'll ask you the second question: Is there ninety five percent addressable market for your ninety five percent problem, or is this unique problem just for severe, right? Right. And and you don't really have an addressable market. Uh, but the thing is, I, I think that building that, you know, you know, I, I think the 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 founders like working with, with with a person like yourself, they can actually hone in on that story to kind of get get that story right to make sure that like literally I I need zero presentation if I'm talking to an investor at, at a networking event, let's say, and if I'm just talking to them, I cannot take my presentation out. I have to talk right. to them. Right. Like, what is that conversation like? You know, what what am I saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, by, so, so, so let, let's back up a little bit. One of the things that you were talking about is like how the brain, like how there's, there is a pattern to this, right? It's not random, right? Like, um, but it's, it's under, it's important to understand why, uh, why we, we fixate on story. And it's really because before we were painting on the inside of caves, we had to pass information uh, from person to person to generation to generation. And it was often stuff like, don't pet the saber, saber tooth tiger. He doesn't <laughs> like that, right? Like, don't eat those berries. They'll kill you. Do this in the summertime. Do this in the wintertime, right? Like, we had to pass information so that the next generation would survive and hopefully our children would su survive. And so whether we were born this way or we developed this over time, um, it, we had to have a way of passing information, right? And so that's where... That's why when you use storytelling, the brain goes, ah, I need to pay attention here. There's something I, probably important that I need to focus on. So that's actually where, you know, the hacking humans concept comes in. It's, it's like we're using, we're using a specific process to get the brain to pay attention. And so there's a little bit of kind of a hack going on there, but it's understanding how that hack works, why it's there. So, um, so j just to kind of you know, talk about that. Cause I think that's important for people to understand is like story makes the brain lock in as opposed to all the facts and figures and other stuff that the brain just goes, okay, that's nice. And you know, it bounces off people. So, um, 
but yeah, I mean, the conversation is essentially, yeah, it's a, it's a, the elevator pitch is a short story, right? Like here's the problem. Here's why, and, and you can say, and here's why it's such a big problem. Explain that further. And then here's the solution, right? And that's a simplified version, but you can, you can do that in 30 seconds if you are clear on what you're doing, what you're solving. Um, but like you said, talking at that higher level, they, uh, you know, they, there's an idea of the curse of knowledge where people who are really high, highly educated on a topic will talk at a level that is much, uh, is much higher above the people that they're talking to. And so the people they're talking to don't follow and understand because they have maybe a base knowledge of whatever it is, artificial intelligence, blockchain, <laughs> crypto, you know, theoretical physics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, metaphysics. Uh, yeah. I mean, whatever, uh, philosophy, right? So, um, so in storytelling, uh, story allows the, the teller to break that down in a simplistic way that the brain will lock in and go, Oh, I understand because you've given it to me in the right format, right? Like you can't go into, you know, DOS and start writing JavaScript. It's just not going to work. But we, as humans, keep attempting to do that over and over and over again by saying, you know, just giving facts and figures or, you know, talking about ourselves the whole time or, you know, whatever it is. It's like, that's not how it works. So when you understand how it works and why it works that way, then you can start to craft your story and start to realize how powerful story can be if you use it in the right way. So. Seth, I think so far we have been talking about storytelling at a very high level, right? Mm -hmm. I want to, if we, if you use the analogy of one of my friends, um, shout out to Robert Souza for giving me this analogy um, of, of landing the helicopter, right? Mm -hmm. we, we were up in the sky. Now we're still not landing. We're in the, somewhere in the middle hovering. Uh, let's use different examples, like three different examples uh, of, of uh, storytelling in three very different uh, situations. Mm -hmm. Where you know you could use I don't know whatever you can from your uh, background uh, three different examples of storytelling where you know uh, uh, set it up, set, you know set us up for it you know like okay. how how it was and how did it change and and how how where did we go from there? Yeah, so I'll I'll give you two uh, personal examples of of stuff that we've done in our business and then I'll give you one uh, example of of bad storytelling that uh, had nothing to do with us. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that we see is uh, really, really poor emails all the time. Like we've, we've all gotten them, we've all seen them and you know, they just come and they hit you up and they start talking about, I'm so-and-so from this company and, um, and we've worked with these people and we've won these awards and we've done all this stuff. And, and I would like to tell you about my product, right? And so, one of my clients um, was, you know, we're going going through this the this whole bug thing, uh, <laughs> and uh, they ended up losing a bunch of contracts in um, because like they literally had contracts that were ready to get signed within like a week or two of um, of this whole thing starting, and everybody pulled back because nobody knew you know, where are we going to be? What's, what's the future going to look like? How bad is this thing going to get? Right. And everybody kind mm -hmm. of batten down the hatches. And so, um, so what we had to start doing was, uh, we had to start using email, right? Like, and going to two potential customers and trying to find them as opposed to them coming to us and hoping they're visiting the website. Cause people, they're not spending money. They're not going to visit the website. So the next thing we had to do was we had to find a, com a compelling problem that people actually had a felt pain right about and outside of the world you know going crazy um and so for this client it was it was the fact that flash was was coming to an end right and a lot of uh enterprise level applications are are you still use flash amazingly it's like the craziest thing and so so we had to so how old how old of school are you macromedia flash or adobe flash uh i've done both i when i was in school it was macromedia yeah. And then, yeah, Adobe took them over, but, um, uh, so, so long story short, we were able to bring in, I think it was $4.3 million, uh, with, of new business through the email campaign. One of the customers that my client was able to land was 3M 
And 3M actually told this company during a, a demo that uh, they just, it was the weirdest thing. Apparently they stopped the meeting and like the head of like global IT, whatever goes, that was the best email campaign we have ever seen. And we get emailed all the time. And, you know, and I just point back to, it's the way that they told the story. The conversation was about the customer and the customer's problem, not about the company and how great the company was, you know, um, and and so changing that all around um, and, and how they how we were changing the conversation and happening that was happening between us and the potential customer, I think made a big difference in that. Also understanding what their felt pain was and just talking about that, right? Like. One of the best ways to become an expert is not to talk about a subject at a surface level, but talk about it at a deep level and then show your customer that you understand it at that deep level and that you care about the fact that they're going through the problem and that you have a solution to fix it, right? Like that is using this crazy thing called empathy. People talk about it sometimes. I don't. <laughs> um, it's a crazy concept. Yeah. So, um, so that's one example. Um, you know, I, I had a, a customer recently that, that wanted some help kind of putting, putting their story together. And, um, and so we, you know, we have a process for this that we worked through, through it with them. And, um, you know, when they were done, they were like, holy crap, this, this got me to think about our customers at a deeper level than we had before. Right. Because we would sit in the meeting and they would, I, you know, I'd take them through and ask them questions. I'm trying to help them build their story. I don't tell them how to do their story. I, I, I facilitate it. Right. And, um, and they would give me answers to stuff. And I, I would say like, for instance, is, is that a problem for you or is that a problem for your customer? Oh, that's a problem for us. This isn't, oh, like, and the light goes on and they're like, I, I didn't realize I was thinking about, you know, us and the company so much. Right. And so, so changing that perspective and then starting to have better communications, you know, it's like. Um, so that was another example. Um, but I mean, yeah, we've had, had people that have been able to, yeah, just literally take, um, a few lines from, from the story and create, like you said, that 30 second elevator pitch and, um, you know, and people go out and they use it and they're like, yeah, they understood it. Right. Like, cause I'd, I'd ask them like, what was the response? They understood they were interested. Right. Well, okay. Now we got to move to the next step, you know, but to give you a bad example, uh, and I talk about this in the book, was uh, when uh, VW and Audi got their hands caught in the cookie jar for, um, you know, doing the false emissions, right? And their tagline, your tagline is part of your story, right? And theirs was, I don't know if it still is, but it was truth and engineering. Yeah. Well, when you get your hand caught in the cookie jar and you're modifying, you know, computer systems to give false readings, right? That's not truth and engineering. That is the exact opposite of truth and engineering, right? And then that becomes a brand problem as well because now you're you're seen as a brand that is dishonest and 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 not truthful. So, um, but you know, I I think in the book another one that I gave example I gave as, as a tagline is um, was a uh, Disneyland's the happiest place on earth, right? They that is part of their brand promise. They try to, you know. Um, fulfill that through your experience at Disneyland and, and everything else. And so there's consistency there. So again, I've gone off into a little bit of a rabbit hole. I apologize or down a rabbit hole, but um, those are just some examples of how, uh, you know, stories that, that we've done, but also how other people make those stories work or not work. So that, that was, I guess, my point. So <laughs> That's not. That's great. Uh, are there? Uh, do you see w problems with startups where where the, um, you know, because you have products and you have services, right? Mm -hmm. um, product based uh, startups versus service based uh, startups. And then the, the example you were using may have been an agency, for example, right, mm -hmm. where they have clients and stuff like that as a services agency. Um, where do you see where where there is m the most uh set of problems as far as storytelling goes uh well i i mean very i i see very few people using storytelling in general um which is weird because we're all storytellers like we literally tell stories we're you know at, like 
every experience that happens to us, we tell it in a story format. But then when we write to other people, we f somehow lose our way, <laughs> we get lost and we're, and we're like, let me just give you the technical specs, right? Like, let me, let me tell you what it does. And, and so with like product-based businesses, um, I, I talk to them about like, how can you create like these, these products could be characters in your story, right? And, and then they start going, oh, I never thought about it that way. And it's like, yeah, you, you know, you could give this example of like, you know, you've got this lip gloss and it likes to go out partying on the weekends and, you know, and, and like, you can start creating stories where people can see themselves using that product in a certain situation. Right. And that's building a simulation of like, what is it like to use our product? That sounds like that product sounds fun. I would like to use that product and I would love to wear that lip gloss to go out. But, um, but with, uh, you know, service-based businesses, um, that's where you tend to definitely focus, uh, even more heavily on the, on the problem because, that's really all anybody cares about. And it's like, is, you know, the, I think we were talking about this earlier, but it's like, you're trying to answer the question in the customer's mind, why the hell should I care? Right. Cause we get inundated with stuff all the time and most of it's just noise. Right. And, and so again, when you use storytelling and you start pulling somebody into that story because they're willing to give you their attention, then you need to tell the story about, you know, what the, what the service is, how it's going to solve their problem. You can talk about why it was created, right? That you maybe went through that problem and now you have the solution. But um, so they tend to they they tend to be uh, there's some there's some crossover between them, but they can be uh, kind of different. And it's like even with like a personal brand that that can even be a different story because like with a personal brand, pe what people really want to know is what did you learn from that experience. Like, don't tell me all the stuff that happened and then, and then that's it. It's like, did you get fire from the gods along the way? <laughs> you know, or, like, that's what I, re I really want to know and understand about your situation. So, um, I hope I answered that correctly. <laughs> um, I'm not grading anything. Uh, I'll let your professor know. Are, are you sure? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that, uh, as an example, Right. If if I if I bring it to like Lord of the Rings, right, as a movie, right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can see that um, as far as the content goes, there's a tremendous amount of content, right? Mm -hmm. Movies mm -hmm. after movies. There are what is it? Three um, uh, Lord of the Ring movies, and then you have the Hobbit three movie, those, uh, series. Yeah. Three of those, like six of them. If you combine all of that, you could like eat up all your weekend wa binge watching everything back to back and no and with yeah. no sleep, right? But the, but the thing is. Uh, every one of those scenes, if you think about it, there, there's an over, overall storyline that mm -hmm. that pulls everything together. But then there are subsets of those stories too, and yeah. I think that's that's really highly relevant when when um, startups talk about features, for example, right? Let's say there there is a in their feature list they have like ten bullet points or eight bullet points that says this is what distinguishes us. We are ninety nine point nine 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 percent uptime, more reliable, whatever, <laughs> right? If let's say that that's one of their their features, and their competition is up only eighty percent of the time, right? So mm -hmm. definitely that's good, right? But then you have to prove that you are up ninety nine point nine percent of the time, and then that one time that you go down, that's disastrous. You, you're not supposed to be down at that time, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that. When it has to do with even very detailed uh, feature list of of who you are as a company, right? And mm -hmm. and what what are you trying to solve? If you could simplify it so that any because most investors get get involved in so many different ventures, right? Mm -hmm. But that you know, there's a huge assumption that the investor is an expert in that in your field. May right. not be. They, they may be independently wealthy because of uh, a business they had. They sold it. They have a ton of money, but they don't know anything about chemical engineering <laughs> that you are an expert in, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. they don't know anything about, I don't know, metaverse or or any or NFTs or anything like that. Very highly technical fields, right? right. But right. if you can simplify it and then you could tell a story around it and say that, oh, you know what? Or maybe do it by association. When people used to do it this way back in the day, now this is a new way of doing it in in today in 2021 right mm -hmm. that that also at least helps bridge 
your story helps bridge uh, my understanding of the world to the solution you're providing in 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 your story yeah well so yeah like um one of the best ways to do that is to use an analogy or a metaphor right this is like is similar to this right and and the reason that works is because in the brain we have syntax and so what our brain does is when we hear new information it tries to reference back and go okay what is what is the thing that seems similar to this so i can comprehend what you're telling me right and but a metaphor uh quite often is another short it's a short encapsulated story like like you said things used to be done this way now they're being now we're going to do it this way and here's why it's important right like that is a short story essentially so um so again, just using these things, right? Like if you're super technical, yeah, if you can come up with analogies to explain how your idea is like something else, you're not saying it is the same or, you know, as this other thing, you're just trying to, like you said, bridge that gap of, of knowledge right there by, by simplifying it and creating a syntax so that the other person can kind of go, okay, I think I, I think I'm following. And then, you know, maybe you have to have a conversation back and forth of like, so I think you're saying this kind of thing. And yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, great. Now we can move on to the next piece. <laughs> well, well, one thing I, I have to say, because I, I, I do travel before the current world situation, I used to travel a mm -hmm. lot uh, mm -hmm. outside of the US. Um, some of my cousins that live outside the US, they've not been to the US at all. When we were having a conversation and this is, I, I realized that I was Americanized uh, because <laughs> from one point, it specifically has to do with you, Seth. Uh -huh. I was, yeah, we were talking about a product and they were so focused on its technical abilities, megahertz, gigabytes, you, you name it, whatever those metrics were, right? Mm -hmm. And I was telling a story about how I can get better, more work done and how it helps me get more, be more productive and stuff like that. Like to me, those are the tangible benefits to me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not technical numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And they looked at me like, why are you telling me a story? It's a product, it works. It, you know, it, this one works faster than that one. This one lasts longer than that one. That's why we are going with that. Why are you telling us all this story? <laughs> and, and funny enough, my elder brother was there uh, with, with me. He goes like, well, one thing uh, you have to understand about America is everything is a story. And, and we tell stories to each other about even our commercials are stories, like mm -hmm. they're mini stories, right? Mm -hmm. Infomercials are mini stories. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, like uh, when, when you think about uh, telling stories, it may be very cultural too, where I may care more about the technical details if I'm a different culture but when you're in American culture, yeah, or or maybe other cultures that believe in stories, right? That it may be very culture, maybe centric to the culture you were brought up in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's the difference between like the Zune, uh, the Microsoft Zune, uh, former <laughs> Zune, right, and uh, the iPod, right? Like Zune was like it has more battery life than an iPod. It has this thing, it's, it's a faster, you can, you know, and, and iPods, you know, marketing was what a thousand songs, 10,000 songs in my pocket. pocket. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it was like, well, I want 10,000 songs in my pocket. That's very clear and easy to understand. Whereas all the technical jargon just gets in the way of like being able to make a decision, right? Because it's, it's a bunch of extra information and the other one's like using an analogy and you're like, I, I understand that. I, I would love to have that many songs in my pocket. That's great. So, um, yeah, I mean, culturally speaking, you know, I, I, I obviously don't know about every culture, but, you know, I know that like one of the reasons that we came up or Joseph Campbell came up with the concept of the hero's journey was that because it didn't matter if we were talking, you know, Babylonian culture from thousands of years ago, Chinese culture, Indian culture, you know, um, Native American culture, like we, for some reason, all these groups kept telling stories in the same format, right? Like you could go back and read the Sanskrit and read, you know, like these, these docu, you know, documents and whatnot. And it's like, well, there's something there. Cause some of these people lived in completely, not even different centuries, but different, like, you know, um, 
millenniums from these other people, but we keep coming back to the same thing. So, so story is, is an innate thing. And that's why, you know, that's why I wrote the book was like, how do we tap into this thing? It's right here in front of us. We got to deal with humans all the time, like I said earlier. So how do we do it better? You know, and that, yeah. So, so Seth, yeah. do you believe that, you know, the thing is we live in a complex society and, and we're complex beings, even though we love sim simplicity. Do you think storytelling is a magic bullet for, for startup founders and entrepreneurs? No, no, I don't. Um, you know, blasphemy, a storyteller doesn't think that, <laughs> that stories solve all the problems, but you know, it's like that, that old saying, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail to you. Um, I do believe, uh, you know, through the research, through the brain scans, through the history, um, through anthropology and everything, um, that it is uh, pretty effective. But what what happens though is if you, you know, are a cat lover and you start telling a story to somebody who hates animals, well, what's going to happen? They're going to be like, I don't care about your stupid story and your stupid cat, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so you can, you can tell, you can use the, um, you know, uh, the pattern of a story and it can still bounce off somebody because they're, you're not talking to them about what they care about. Right. And, and I mean, I've seen that in my own business, you know, startups will come and they'll say, here's who we think our customer is. Great. We can write a story for that. You know, we use that story and then it's like no response. And, it, and it's like, okay, why didn't they respond to that? You said that they were this way. And it's like, well, that's what we thought they were. And I'm like, ah, so we're missing some market research <laughs> and some other stuff. You guys are making guesses, right? And, and so it's hard for me to, to target that story in the right way. If you're making guesses on who your audience is or your, your customer base is or whatever, right? Like I need to know what that problem is and then I can write the story around that problem. But if you don't know what your customer's problem is, then I can't solve that for you. Like, like I said earlier, I can help you shoot the arrow straighter but you're still shooting the arrow at the end of the day. And so, yeah, it's not exactly a magic bullet, but it is going to be far more effective than shouting at people, running a bunch of ads, blabbing in their face, talking about yourself, doing all this other stuff wrong. Right. So, um, so no, it's, it's not a magic bullet. I wish it were, uh, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. I was actually listening to, I forgot, I forgot which, um, book it was. Um, I apologize for that, but, um, there was an example of um, of a hospital. Uh, actually, it was a, it was a one of those medical devices, the MRI machine, mm -hmm. right? Really highly technical, right? Highly mm -hmm. technical, and and this unit uh, was specifically pediatric MRI for, for little kids, mm -hmm. right? And when they have to get their brain scan and spinal scan and other types of scans, right? Um, and and they. Initially, to them, it was the accuracy of the machine, how well it, how specific it was, and how targeted, and how the image was so brilliantly clear and stuff like that. What they missed in that story is the kids who are, who have to get into this machine. Right. Now, how scary uh, Seth, it is. Do you have yeah. kids? Uh, yes, I have two two daughters. Yeah. Two daughters. So imagine imagine that, right? If your kids are walking, are getting into this, God forbid, if if if, if they ever had to get into this MRI machine, the anxiety, the stress, the crying, the fact that you cannot be in the room with them holding their hands. Do you have to, you have to leave the room and they have to be alone by themselves in this machine, right? Yeah. And you can't move and it makes weird noises. So yeah, it's super. And, you, and you're like completely you know, in one position. Mm. So what this hospital uh, missed and, and, and that, that was a part of the story was that, um, uh, uh, was, was thinking actually about not the fact that it's an incredible machine that the doctors and radiologists would be super happy to have, but the end customer being that little kid that has to climb into this thing. How can we make it fun? So they actually made it more like a boat ride and, mm. and they turned it into a fun thing that they would be doing. And the outcome of it would be to create sort of a less stressful environment. So even storytelling uh, in that kind of a scenario mm -hmm. is is a is a very helpful that that when you're thinking that oh you know what this is a technical thing they need to just put on the hospital gown jump on this thing hold still for 15 minutes sometimes one hour right 
yeah. for MRI. And then, yeah, but this person is not 40 years old. Yeah. It's a six year old child. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're expecting them to hold still, you know? So that's the, uh, I, I think the power of storytelling when you're thinking about even in a situation like that, you have to think about like, how can your solution, what you are bringing to this world may, may need to see the light of day, but how are you addressing it? How are you, you know, uh, addressing your end consumer? Or do you have enough empathy? You know, you mentioned empathy earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have enough empathy to understand and if you don't, like, that's fine. You may be very highly technical, amazing engineering mind, but understand at the same time that you, maybe you don't have the skill set to be empathetic or, or to tell that story or or to do that. Then get someone that can. Just yeah. just be reasonable with that, you know, because there are so many founders, um, you know, and we have had a lot of founders on this show. Mm -hmm. They are incredible at what they do. Phenomenal. Phenomenal engineers are, you know, the likes of like Snapchat to uh, Facebook to Dropbox to, I mean, think of all the facilities we have in our lives now, all the easy things that happen to us. But at the same time, for every one of those that come up with the solution that makes things faster, better, and so on and so forth, there needs to be a person that needs to, you know, tell, tell that story to make that, you know, to make that point. Otherwise, you know, I'm sure that you have come across brands and which brings me to the next question. Mm. Have you come across brands that, you know, you advise them, you gave them the story, you you led them to the water, they, they needed to drink and they didn't drink. What happened? Um, yeah, I mean, we we've had a couple of of customers who, um, you know, they were like they were interested. You know, they talked. We 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 took them through that education process. Here's why this is important. Here's why we do it this way, not other ways. Um, and and they they were like no 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 and then six months later they come back and they're like okay maybe we were wrong about that you know like but i mean you know we have people that that talk to us and then they're like no i don't i don't think i want to do it that way and i don't really focus on what happens to them after the fact <laughs> you know they're not one of our clients so i don't i don't sit around going Oh, I hope they failed. You know, like <laughs> I, I, I just kind of forget about them and move on. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we've we've uh, we've had people after the fact change some stuff, and then they're like, you know, hey, this isn't working. You know, and they come back and they talk to us, and I'm like, well, that's because you changed this, right? Like, like you took out the villain. You, you know, like you you made yourself the hero, like whatever it is, like they, they tweak some of the language and how the story flows. And then all of a sudden it, it's like, it doesn't make sense anymore. Right. It's like going watching a bad movie and you're just come out of it confused and like, I don't know what's going on here. Right. And it's because, um, you know, it's, there's a, you know, like I said, there is an order of operations and there is, there are steps to this process. And if, if you try to jump ahead or, or move things around, there is some flexibility in, in, in storytelling, I'm not saying like it, it can't be this way, but it can make things confusing. Like a lot of people saw Memento. Memento can be confusing for people because everything is flashbacks and the movie's going basically in reverse and forward at the same time. Kind of like Tenet. Oh, Tenet. <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. I, I did too. It was, what it was it very was confusing. <laughs> probably what it, one of my favorite movies, but it's also confusing in a different way. But but the storytelling in Memento is is like flashbacks. Like wait we know the ending of the story and now we're moving backwards through the story to understand how the character got to where they are. That's doable, but it's also kind of confusing. So, so you can, like I said, do some mix and match, but really um, you want it to kind of follow a, a correct order of operations and then, you know, and just move the people through that, um, through all those pieces of understanding that they need to be able to go, I get it. <laughs> I know why this is important. I, I, I know why I should care about this. So, yeah. So, Seth, when uh, after uh, you come up, you structure it, and you you come up with a story that the the startup should be telling, right? Is there a um, like a pilot period that they try it out, and what does that trial look like? I mean, is there a test that they could try out and see? Is there acceptance surveys, anything like that? What what is the scientific side of it, or is it all qualitative? Um, no. So one of the ways that I like to test things is um, send out do email campaigns, 
right? They're free. Um, you can get them in front of a bunch of people and, um, and then see if they're responding and how are they responding, right? Are they responding favorably or are they responding with silence, right? Um, like when you hit, when you're hitting the right story, then people will respond, right? Like I said, we're in the, in the middle of the world changing and, um, and, you know, we're able to drum up, you know, $4.3 million of new business when everybody's like, no, we can't spend money. We don't know where the world's going, you know? Um, but that was because we knew what the problem was and we told a story about it. We didn't go to them and tell them we're so amazing at fixing flash problems, blah, 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 blah. We showed them that we understood that flash was coming to an end. We talked to them about, you know, what does that mean? What does that look like? What are your options? Right? Like, so, so email is a great way to test a story out quickly. Um, and then see, do you get replies or do you just get ignored? Um, and if you're getting ignored, it means whatever you're saying to, to that audience is not resonating with it. Right. Um, you know, you can run, obviously run ads, um, for small budgets, you know, that's another simple thing to do, but, um, you know, it really depends on, on where you're at. Um, what you don't want to do is, is just, um, uh, throw a ton of money at something and hope that it works. Right. Like, cause that's just a waste of time and effort anyway. So that's why it's like, um, you know, with us, like we, you know, we started talking about this concept of how do you hack humans and that, um, started getting a response from people. That's really interesting. What do you, how do you do that? What is, what are you talking about? As opposed to saying, or, you know, we do storytelling, right? Like the conversation kind of changed, changed from there, or we do web design or we do branding or whatever. It's like, like you have to kind of reposition things. Um, but anyway, those are, those are a few simple things, but like, yeah, that like, if you can send an email to somebody and get a response, then you're probably on the right track. And maybe the story needs to be tweaked a little bit more, but like, like I said, that's a basic ground level starting thing. And, and really, how do you write a good email? I actually explain the whole thing in my book. Like, I don't like go, oh, you just need to write better emails and then not tell you how to write them. <laughs> like, I'm like, here's how you structure them. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. This is the order. Um, so anyway, that, that's that's how we like to test a lot of things for our customers. But by the way, Seth was kind enough to actually give us uh, a, a special uh, chapter, one chapter for you to check out the first uh, chapter of the book. Here we go. Uh, if you if you type that into your browser, uh, www.storifyagency.com slash this week with Sabir, uh, he will send you the first uh, chapter for free. Uh, so you can check it out before you commit to it on, on Amazon and, and buy the book, uh, whether you're buying the the Kindle version or the paperback or the even the hardcover exists, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I actually have it right here. It's like, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that was a paperback, right? Or was it? No, the, that was the hardcover. That was hardcover. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you see, um, w with all of the clients you've had, um, do you see a hesitation? What, what is that hesitation like uh, that you see it as a common thread across all founders? that they don't want to they don't want to take the steps because it's a change for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so I mean, imagine you come from a technical background, right? And everything is facts and figures, right? Mm -hmm. Like that stuff has to be right, right? Or else things don't work, right? Your system breaks, your plane doesn't fly, whatever it is, like the engineering background that a lot of the founders come from, not all of them, but a lot of them do um makes them focus on facts really the facts and figure side of, sides of things because that's what they understand that's how they were trained that's what makes sense that's how we know this thing's working or not working right then you have to kind of pull them out of out of that mindset into well now we're going to go into the world of you know storytelling which is more of an art as opposed to well, it's a science. Yeah, it's becoming more of a science now that we have more neuroscience to say, no, here's what's actually happening. Um, but yeah, you have to pull them out of that world, which is why when I wrote the book, the first third of the book is the neuroscience, right? So I'm not just going, here's my opinion. Here's what I think things are. I'm saying, no, here's what science is telling us about the brain. And so when you make that appeal to a founder, 
that's more factual and logical as opposed to going, just trust me, I got this. <laughs> you know, like, um, that starts to make more sense. And then when you get into biology and, um, you know, you know, um, you know, evolutionary terms or, you know, then, then they can go, okay, I, I get, I get why this is important. So that's, that's why I've, you know, I said earlier that it's, it's really an education process. Like I kind of have to take them through and sort of tell them a story, if you will, but I have to do it with more facts and figures so that they'll understand that it's not a bunch of BS. So you're trying to actually, you know, sync up your frequency with their frequency. Yeah. Yeah. Before you bring them onto your frequency the other way around. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get on the same page, as they say. <laughs> uh, so, Seth, f phenomenal recommendations and, uh, and advice and insights. Uh, what is your, because this is what I ask every one of my guests, what is your number one $100,000 uh, expert insight into storytelling for startups? What's your number one insight and, uh, and advice? It, it's, it's. Uh... I'll, I'll tell you what, before you jump in, get the book first. That's number one <laughs> advice. Let's go with with the with the number one now. Yeah. So so I I said it in in the in the conversation, and I think some people may have caught it, some people may have missed it. But really, any kind of marketing, um, the message is about your customer. It's not about you. And I, and I see that as one of the biggest problems that that people um, fall into. And and I get why it happens because we're all we're all our own hero. We're all kind of, you know, self important and self-absorbed, self but not like necessarily in a bad way. It's just, you know, we kind of tend to be number one. So then when we go to talk to people, like we want to have that conversation about ourselves because we're the most interesting person. And it's like, no, when you're, when you're dealing with customers, you have to talk about them and their problems. So any kind of marketing, even if you're not using storytelling, just the fact that you're, you write an, an email, for instance, saying you, your, Right, that changes the conversation. But if the conversation is me, us, we, our, I, right, then I'm making the conversation about myself. And just that that little change right there is going to help people to be more responsive to any kind of marketing you do, even if you don't use storytelling. So that's it's simple, but it's overlooked all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Seth. Thank you for being on the show and, and sharing your your uh insights and humor and definitely <laughs> i would highly recommend for you guys to pick up the book one, one thing besides learning uh this topic it's a very humorous book it's very funny uh, i i i would highly recommend for people to uh pick up this book and thank you audience to the live audience that joined us uh in and out but uh also if you're catching this on a, on a recording i uh, thank you for for watching it and uh please uh you know add any kind of comments or questions or whatever you have and Seth and I will be looking for for those. And if we can help you, we can definitely uh, jump in and and start com conversing. But definitely pick up the book. And Seth, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been fun.